In this video, we're going to look at stochastic gradient descent learning for a neural network, particularly the mini-batch version, which is probably the most widely used learning algorithm for large neural networks. We've seen this before, but let's start with a reminder about what the error surface looks like for a linear neuron. The error surface means a surface that lies in a space where the horizontal axes correspond to the weights of the neural net, and the vertical axis corresponds to the error it makes. For a linear neuron with a squared error, that surface always forms a quadratic bowl. The vertical cross-sections are parabolas, and the horizontal cross-sections are ellipses. For multi-layer non-linear nets, the error surface is much more complicated, but as long as the weights aren't too big, it's a smooth error surface, and locally it's well approximated by a fraction of a quadratic bowl. It might not be the bottom of the bowl, um, but there's a piece of quadratic bowl that will fit the local error surface very well. If we look at the convergence speed when we do full batch learning, when the error surface is a quadratic bowl, the obvious thing to do is go downhill. This will reduce the error. But the problem is that the direction of steepest descent does not point to the place we want to go to. As you see in the ellipse, the direction of steepest descent is almost at right angles to the direction we want to go in. We've got a gradient that's very big across the ellipse, which is a direction in which we only want to travel a small distance, and the gradient's very small along the ellipse, and that's a direction in which we want to travel a large distance. It's precisely the wrong way round. Now you might think that studying linear systems like this um, is not a good idea if you want to optimize big nonlinear nets. But even for these nonlinear multilayer nets, this kind of a problem arises. It's a very similar problem that arises, even though the error surfaces aren't globally quadratic bowls. Locally, they have all these same kinds of properties. That is, they tend to be very curved in some directions and very uncurved in other directions. So the way the learning goes wrong, if you use a big learning rate, is that you slosh to and fro in the directions in which the error surface is very curved. So we'll say, call that sloshing across a ravine. And with the learning rate too big, you'll actually diverge. What we want to achieve is that we go quickly along the ravine in directions that have small but very consistent gradients. And we move slowly in directions with these big but very inconsistent gradients. That is, if you go in that direction for a short distance, the gradient will reverse sign. Before we go into how we achieve that, I need to talk a little bit about stochastic gradient descent and the motivation for using it. If you have a data set that's highly redundant, then if you compute the gradient for a weight on the first half of the data set, you'll get almost exactly the same answer as you get if you compute the gradient on the second half. So it's a complete waste of time to compute the gradient on the whole data set. You'd be much better off computing the gradient on a subset of the data, then updating the weights, and on the remaining data, computing the gradient for the updated weights. We can take that to extremes and say we're going to compute the gradient on a single training case, we're going to update the weights, and then we're going to compute the gradient on the next training case using those new weights. That's called online learning. In general, we don't want to go quite that far. It's usually better to use small mini-batches, typically 10 or 100 or even 1,000 examples. One advantage of a small mini-batch is that less computation is used for actually updating the weights, because you do that less often compared with online. Another advantage is that when you compute the gradient, you can compute the gradient for a whole bunch of cases in parallel. Most computers are very good at doing matrix matrix multiplies and that will allow you to consider a whole bunch of training cases and apply the weights to a whole bunch of training cases at the same time to figure out the activities going into the next layer for all of those training cases. That gives you a matrix matrix multiply and it's very efficient especially on a graphics processor unit. One point about using mini batches is you wouldn't want to have a mini batch in which the answer is always the same, and then on the next mini-batch, have a different answer that's always the same. 
that would cause the weights to slosh unnecessarily. The ideal, if you have say 10 classes, would be to have a mini batch with say 10 examples or 100 examples that has exactly the same number from each class in the mini batch. One way to approximate that is simply to take all your data and just put it in random order and grab random mini batches. But you must avoid having mini batches that are very uncharacteristic of the whole set of data because the mini batch is all of one class. So basically there's two types of learning algorithms for neural nets. There's full gradient algorithms where you compute the gradient from all of the training cases and once you've done that there's a lot of clever ways to speed up learning. There's things like nonlinear versions of a method called conjugate gradient. The optimization community has been studying the general problem of how you optimize smooth nonlinear functions for many years. Now multilayer neural networks are pretty untypical of the kinds of problems they study so applying the methods they developed may need a lot of modification to make them work for these multilayer neural networks. But when you have highly redundant and large training sets it's nearly always better to use mini batch learning. The mini batches may need to be quite big but that's not so bad because big mini batches are more computationally efficient. I'm now going to describe a basic mini batch gradient descent learning algorithm. This is what most people would use when they started training a big neural net on a big redundant data set. You start by guessing an initial learning rate and you look to see if the network learns satisfactorily or if the error keeps getting worse or oscillates wildly. If that happens you reduce the learning rate. You also look to see if the error is falling too slowly. You expect that the error might fluctuate a bit if you measure it on a validation set because the gradient on each mini batch is just a rough estimate of the overall gradient. So you don't want to reduce the learning rate every time the error rises. But what you're hoping is the error will fall fairly consistently. And if it's falling fairly consistently and very slowly, you can probably increase the learning rate. Once you've got that working, you can then write a simple program to automate that way of adjusting the learning rate. One thing that nearly always helps is towards the end of learning with mini batches, it helps to turn down the learning rate. That's because you're going to get fluctuations in the weights caused by the fluctuations in the gradients that come from the mini batches. And you'd like a final set of weights that's a good compromise. So when you turn down the learning rate, you're smoothing away those fluctuations and getting a final set of weights that's good for many mini batches. So a good time to turn down the learning rate is when the error stops decreasing consistently. And a good criterion for saying the error stopped decreasing is to use the error on a separate validation set. That is, it's a bunch of examples that you are not using for training and also they're not going to be used for your final test. In this video, we're going to look at a number of issues that arise when using stochastic gradient descent with mini batches. There's a large number of tricks that make things work much better. These are the kind of black art of neural networks. And I'm going to go over some of the main tricks in this video. The first issue I want to talk about is initializing the weights of a neural network. If two hidden units have exactly the same weights and same biases, both incoming and outgoing, then they can never become different from one another because they will always get exactly the same gradient. So to allow them to learn different feature detectors, you need to start them off different from one another. We do this by using small random weights to initialize the weights. That breaks the symmetry. Those small random weights um, shouldn't all necessarily be the same size as each other. So if you've got a hidden unit that has a very big fan in, if you use quite big weights, it'll tend to saturate it. So you can afford to use much smaller weights for a hidden unit that has a very big fan in. If you have a hidden unit with a very small fan in, you want to use bigger weights. And since the weights are random, it scales with the square root of the number of the weights. And so a good principle is to make the size of the initial weights be proportional to the square root of the fanning. We can also scale the learning rates for the weights the same way. One thing that has a surprisingly big effect on the speed with which a neural network will learn 
is shifting the inputs. That is adding a constant to each of the components of the inputs. It seems surprising that that could make much difference. But when you're using steepest descent, shifting an input value by adding a constant can make a very big difference. It usually helps to shift each component of the input so that averaged over all of the training data it has a value of zero. That is, make sure its mean is zero. So suppose we have a little neural net like this, just a linear neuron with two weights. And suppose we have some training cases. The first training case says when the inputs are 101 and 101, it should give an output of 2. And the second one says when they're 101 and 99, it should give an output of 0. And I'm using colour here to indicate which training case I'm talking about. If you look at the error surface you get for those two training cases, it looks like this. The green line is the line along which the weights will satisfy the first training case. And the red line is the line along which the weights will satisfy the second training case. And what we notice is that they're almost parallel. And so when you combine them, you get a very elongated ellipse. One way to think about what's going on here is that because we're using a squared error measure, we get a parabolic trough along the red line. The red line is the bottom of this parabolic trough that tells us the squared error we'll be getting on the red case. And there's another parabolic trough with the green line along its bottom. And it turns out, although this may surprise your spatial intuition, if you add together two parabolic troughs, you get a quadratic bowl, an elongated quadratic bowl in this case. So that's where that error surface came from. Now look what happens if we subtract 100 from each of those two input components. We get a completely different error surface. It's, in this case, it's a circle, it's ideal. The green line is the line along which the weights add to 2. We're going to take the first weight and multiply it by 1, we're going to take the second weight and multiply it by 1, and we need to get 2, so the weights better add to 2. The red line is the line along which the two weights are equal because we're going to take the first weight and multiply it by 1, and we're going to take the second weight and multiply it by minus 1, so if the weights are equal, we'll be able to get that 0 that we need. So the error surface in this case is a nice circle where gradient descent is really easy, and all we did was subtract 100 from every input. If you're thinking about what happens not with the inputs, but with the hidden units, it makes sense to have hidden units that are hyperbolic tangents that go between minus 1 and 1. The hyperbolic tangent is simply twice the logistic minus 1. And the reason that makes sense is because then the activities of the hidden units are roughly mean 0, and that should make the learning faster in the next layer. Of course that's only true if the inputs to the hyperbolic tangents are distributed sensibly around 0. But in that respect, a hyperbolic tangent is better than a logistic. However, there's other respects in which a logistic's better. For example, a logistic gives you a rug to sweep things under. It gives an output of zero, and if you make its input even smaller than it was, the output's still zero. So fluctuations in big negative inputs are ignored by the logistic. For the hyperbolic tangent, you have to go out to the end of its plateaus before it can ignore anything. Another thing that makes a big difference is scaling the inputs. When we're using steepest descent, scaling the input values is a very simple thing to do. We transform them so that each component of the input has unit variance over the whole training set, so that it has a typical value of 1 or minus 1. So again, if we take this simple net with two weights and we look at the error surface, when the first component is very small and the second component is much bigger, we get an error surface in which we get an ellipse that's got very high curvature where the input component's big because small changes in the weight make a big difference to the output and very low curvature in the direction in which the input component is small because small changes to the weight hardly make any difference to the error. The colour here is indicating which axis we're using, not which training example we're using, as it did in the previous slide.
If we simply change the variance of the inputs, just rescale them, make the first component 10 times as big and the second component 10 times as small, we now get a nice circular error surface. Shifting and scaling the inputs is a very simple thing to do. There's something that's a bit more complicated that actually works even better because it's guaranteed to give you a circle, a circular error surface, at least it is for a linear neuron. What we do is we try and decorrelate the components of the input vectors. In other words, if you take two components and look at how they're correlated with one another over the whole training set, like if you remember the early example, how the number of portions of chips and the number of portions of ketchup might be highly correlated, we want to try and get rid of those correlations. That will make learning much easier. There's actually many ways to decorrelate things. For those of you who know about principal components analysis, a very sensible thing to do is apply principal components analysis, remove the components that have the smallest eigenvalues, which already achieve some dimensionality reduction, and then scale the remaining components by dividing them by the square roots of their eigenvalues. For a linear system, that will give you a circular error surface. If you don't know about principal components, we'll cover it later in the course. Once you've got a circular error surface, the gradient points straight towards the minimum, so learning is really easy. Now I want to talk about a few of the common problems that people encounter. One thing that can happen is if you start with a learning rate that's much too big, you drive the hidden units either to be firmly on or firmly off. That is, their incoming weights are very big and positive or very big and negative, and their state no longer depends on the input. And of course that means that error derivatives coming from the output won't affect them because they're on their plateaus where the derivative is basically zero. And so learning will stop. Because people are expecting to see local minima, when learning stops they say, oh, I'm at a local minimum and the error is terrible. So there are these really bad local minima. Usually that's not true. Usually it's because you got stuck out on the end of a plateau. A second problem that occurs is if you're classifying things and you're using either a squared error or a cross entropy error, the best guessing strategy is normally to make the output unit equal to the proportion of the time that it should be one. The network will fairly quickly find that strategy and so the error will fall quickly. But particularly if the network has many layers, it may take a long time before it improves much on that. Because to improve over the guessing strategy, it has to get sensible information from the input through all the hidden layers to the output. And that could take a long time to learn if you start with small weights. So again, you learn quickly, and then the error stops decreasing. And it looks like a local minimum, but actually it's another plateau. I mentioned earlier that towards the end of learning you should turn down the learning rate. Um, you should also be careful about turning down the learning rate too soon. When you turn down the learning rate, you reduce the random fluctuations in the error due to the different gradients on different mini-batches. But of course you also reduce the rate of learning. So if you look at the red curve, you see that when we turned the learning rate down we got a quick win. The error fell. But after that we get slower learning. And if we do that too soon, we're going to lose relative to the green curve. So don't turn down the learning rate too soon, or too much. I'm now going to talk about four main ways to speed up mini-batch learning a lot. The previous things I talked about were kind of a bag of tricks for making things work better. And these are four methods, all explicitly designed to make the learning go much faster. I'm now going to talk about a method called momentum. In this method, we don't use the gradient to change the position of the weights. That is, if you think of the weights as a ball on the error surface, standard gradient descent uses the gradient to change the position of that ball. You simply multiply the gradient by a learning rate and change the position of the ball by that vector. In the momentum method, we use the gradient to accelerate this ball that is, the gradient changes its velocity, and then the velocity is what changes the position of the ball. The reason that's different 
is because the ball can have momentum. That is, it remembers previous gradients in its velocity. A second method for speeding up mini-batch learning is to use a separate adaptive learning rate for each parameter, and then to slowly adjust that learning rate based on empirical measurements. And the obvious empirical measurement is, are we keeping making progress by changing the weights in the same direction, or does the gradient keep oscillating around so that the sign of the gradient keeps changing? If the sign of the gradient keeps changing, what we're going to do is reduce the learning rate, and if it keeps staying the same, we're going to increase the learning rate. A third method is what I now call RMS prop, and what we do in this method is we divide by a running average of the magnitudes of the recent gradients for that weight. So that if the gradients are big, you divide by a large number, and if the gradients are small, you divide by a small number. That will deal very nicely with a wide range of different gradients. It's actually a mini-batch version of just using the sign of the gradient, which is a method called RPROP that was designed for full-batch learning. The final way of speeding up learning, which is what optimization people would naturally recommend, is to use full-batch learning and to use a fancy method that takes curvature information into account. To adapt that method to work for neural nets, and then maybe to try and adapt it some more so it works with mini-batches. I'm not going to talk about that in this lecture. In this video, we're going to look at the momentum method for improving the learning speed when doing gradient descent in a neural network. The momentum method can be applied to full batch learning, but it also works for mini batch learning. It's very widely used, and probably the commonest recipe for learning big neural nets is to use stochastic gradient descent with mini batches combined with momentum. I'm going to start with the intuition behind the momentum method. So we think of a ball on the error surface where the location of the ball in the horizontal plane represents the current weight vector. The ball starts off stationary, and so initially it will follow the direction of steepest descent. It'll follow the gradient. But as soon as it's got some velocity, it'll no longer go in the same direction as the gradient its momentum will make it keep going in the previous direction. Obviously we wanted eventually to get to a low point on the surface, so we wanted to lose energy. So we need to introduce a bit of viscosity. That is, we make its velocity die off gently on each update. What the momentum method does is it damps oscillations in directions of high curvature. So if you look at the red starting point, and then look at the green point we get to after two steps, they have gradients that are pretty much equal and opposite. As a result, the gradient across the ravine has cancelled out, but the gradient along the ravine has not cancelled out. Along the ravine, we're going to keep building up speed, and so after the momentum method settled down, it'll tend to go along the bottom of the ravine accumulating velocity as it goes, and if you're lucky that'll make you go a whole lot faster than if you just did steepest descent. The equations of the momentum method are fairly simple. We say that the velocity vector at time t is just the velocity vector at time t minus 1. Time here is the updates of the weights. So it's the velocity vector that we got after mini batch t minus 1 attenuated a bit, so we multiply by some number like 0.9, which is really viscosity, um, or it's related to viscosity, but unfortunately I called it momentum, so we now call alpha momentum. And then we add in the effect of the current gradient, which is to make us go downhill by some learning rate times the gradient that we have at time t. And that'll be our new velocity at time t. We then make our weight change at time t equal to the velocity. That velocity can actually be expressed in terms of previous weight changes, as is shown on the slide here, and I'll leave it to you to follow the math. The behavior of the momentum method is very intuitive. On an error surface that's just a plane, the ball will reach some terminal velocity 
at which the gain in velocity that comes from the gradient is balanced by the multiplicative attenuation of the velocity due to the momentum term, which is really viscosity. If that momentum term is close to 1, then it'll be going down much faster than a simple gradient descent method would. So the terminal velocity, the velocity you get at time infinity, is the gradient times the learning rate multiplied by this factor of 1 over 1 minus alpha. So if alpha is 0.99, you'll go 100 times as fast as you would with the learning rate alone. You have to be careful in setting momentum. At the very beginning of learning, if you make the initial random weights quite big, there may be very large gradients. You have a bunch of weights that's completely no good for the task you're doing, and it may be very obvious how to change these weights to make things a lot better. You don't want a big momentum, because you're going to quickly change them to make things better, and then you're going to start on the hard problem of finding out how to get just the right relative values of different weights, so you have sensible feature detectors. So it pays at the beginning of learning to have a small momentum. It's probably better to have 0.5 than 0, because 0.5 will average out some sloshes in obvious ravines. Once the large gradients have disappeared, and you've reached the sort of normal phase of learning, where you're stuck in a ravine, and you need to go along the bottom of this ravine without sloshing to and fro sideways, you can smoothly raise the momentum to its final value. Or you could raise it in one step, but that might start an oscillation. You might think that, why don't we just use a bigger learning rate? But what you'll discover is that using a small learning rate and a big momentum allows you to get away with an overall learning rate that's much bigger than you could have had if you used learning rate alone with no momentum. If you use a big learning rate by itself, you'll get big divergent oscillations across the ravine. Very recently, um, Ilya Sutskiva has discovered that there's a better type of momentum. The standard momentum method works by first computing the gradient at the current location. It combines that with its stored memory of previous gradients, which is in the velocity of the ball, and then it takes a big jump in the direction of the current gradient combined with previous gradients. So that's its accumulated gradient direction. Ilya Satskiva has found that it works better in many cases to use a form of momentum suggested by Nesterov, who was trying to optimize convex functions, where we first make a big jump in the direction of the previous accumulated gradient, and then we measure the gradient where we end up and make a correction. It's very, very similar, and you need a picture to really understand the difference. One way of thinking about what's going on is, in the standard momentum method, you add in the current gradient, and then you gamble on this big jump. In the Nesterov method, you use your previous accumulated gradient, you make the big jump, and then you correct yourself at the place you've got to. So here's the picture, when we first make the jump, and then make a correction. Here's a step in the direction of the accumulated gradient. So this depends on the gradient we'd accumulated um, on our previous iteration. We take that step. We then measure the gradient and go downhill in the direction of the gradient, like that. We then combine that little correction step with the big jump we made to get our new accumulated gradient. We then take that accumulated gradient, we attenuate it by some number, like 0.9 or 0.99, we multiply it by that number, and we now take our next big jump in the direction of that accumulated gradient, like that. Then again, at the place where we end up, we measure the gradient, and we go downhill. That corrects any errors we made, and we get our new accumulated gradient. Now if you compare that with the standard momentum method, the standard momentum method starts with an accumulated gradient that's like that initial brown vector, but then it measures the gradient where it is, 
So it measures the gradient at its current location, and it adds that to the brown vector so that it makes a jump like this big blue vector. That's just the brown vector plus the current gradient. It turns out, if you're going to gamble, it's much better to gamble and then make a correction than to make a correction and then gamble. In this video, we're going to look at a method that was developed in the late 1980s by Robbie Jacobs and then improved by a number of other people. The idea is that each connection in the neural net should have its own adaptive learning rate, which we set empirically by observing what happens to the weight on that connection when we update it. So that if the weight keeps reversing its gradient, we turn down the learning rate. And if the gradient stays consistent, we turn up the learning rate. So let's start by thinking why having separate adaptive learning rates on each connection is a good idea. The problem is that in a deep multilayer net, the learning rates can vary widely between different weights, especially between weights in different layers. So if, for example, we start with small weights, the gradients are often much smaller in the initial layers than in the later layers. Another factor that causes us to want different learning rates for different weights is the fan-in of a unit. The fan-in determines the size of the overshoot effects that you get when you simultaneously change many of the different incoming weights to fix up the same error. It may be that the unit didn't get enough input. When you change all these weights at the same time to fix up the error, it now gets too much input. Obviously that effect's going to be bigger if there's a bigger fan-in. So the net in the diagram on the right has the same fan-in for both layers, um, more or less the same fan-in for both layers but that's very different in some nets. So the idea is that we're going to use a global learning rate, which we set by hand, and then we're going to multiply it by a local gain that's determined empirically for each weight. A simple way to determine what those local gains should be is to start with a local gain of 1 for every weight, so that initially we're going to change the weight wij by the learning rate times the gain of 1, gij, times the error derivative for that weight. Then what we're going to do is we're going to adapt gij. We're going to increase gij if the gradient for the weight does not change sign. And we're going to use small additive increases and multiplicative decreases. So if the gradient for the weight at time t has the same sign as the gradient for the weight at time t minus 1, where t refers to weight updates, then when you take their product, it'll be positive, because you're either to get two negative gradients or two positive gradients. And then what we're going to do is increase gij by a small additive amount. If the gradients have opposite signs, we're going to decrease gij, and because we want to damp down gij quickly if it's already big, we're going to decrease it multiplicatively. That ensures that big gains will decay very rapidly if oscillations start. It's interesting to ask what would happen if the gradient was totally random. So on each update of the weights, pick a random gradient. Then you'll get an equal number of increases and decreases, because it will equally often be the same sign as the previous gradient or the opposite sign. And so you'll get a bunch of additive 0.05 increases and multiplicative 0.95 decreases, and they have an equilibrium point, which is when the gain is 1. If the gain's bigger than 1, the multiplying by 0.95 will reduce it by more than adding 0.05. If the gain's smaller than 1, adding 0.05 will increase it more than multiplying by 0.95 decreases it. So with random gradients, we'll hover around 1. And if the gradient is consistently in the same direction, we can get much bigger than 1. If the gradient is consistently in opposite directions, which means we're oscillating across a ravine, we can get much smaller than 1. There's a number of tricks for making the adaptive learning rates work better. It's important to limit the size of the gains. A reasonable range is 0.1 to 10 or 0.01 to 100. You don't want the gains to get huge, because then you can easily get into an instability and they won't die down fast enough and you'll destroy all the weights. 
The adaptive learning rates was designed for full batch learning. You can also apply it with mini batches, but they better be pretty big mini batches. That'll ensure that the sign, change in signs of gradients aren't due to the sampling error of mini batches. They really are due to going to the other side of a ravine. There's nothing to prevent you combining adaptive learning rates with momentum. So Jacob suggests that instead of using the agreement in sign between the current gradient and the previous gradient, use the agreement in sign between the current gradient and the velocity for that weight, so the accumulated gradient. And if you do that, you get a nice combination of the advantages of momentum and the advantages of adaptive learning rates. So adaptive learning rates only deal with axis aligned effects. Whereas momentum doesn't care about the alignment of the axes. Momentum can deal with these diagonal ellipses and going in that diagonal direction quickly, um, which adaptive learning rates can't do. In this video, I'm first going to introduce a method called RProp that is used for full batch learning. It's like Robbie Jacobs method, um, but not quite the same. I'm then going to show how to extend RProp so that it works for mini batches. This gives you the advantages of RProp and it also gives you the advantage of mini batch learning which is essential for large redundant datasets. The method that we end up with called RMSProp is currently my favoured method as a sort of basic method for learning the weights in a large neural network with a large redundant dataset. I'm now going to describe RProp which is an interesting way of trying to deal with the fact that gradients vary widely in their magnitudes. Some gradients can be tiny and others can be huge and that makes it hard to choose a single global learning rate. If we're doing full batch learning we can cope with this big variation in gradients by just using the sign of the gradient. That makes all of the weight updates be the same size. For issues like escaping from plateaus with very small gradients, this is a great technique because even with tiny gradients we'll take quite big steps. We couldn't achieve that just by turning up the learning rate because then the steps we took for weights that had big gradients would be much too big. RProp combines the idea of just using the sign of the gradient with the idea of making the step size depend on which weight it is. So to decide how much to change a weight, you don't look at the magnitude of the gradient. You just look at the sign of the gradient, but you do look at the step size that you've decided on for that weight. And that step size adapts over time, again, without looking at the magnitude of the gradient. So we increase the step size for a weight multiplicatively, for example by a factor of 1.2, if the signs of the last two gradients agree. This is like in Robbie Jacobs' adaptive weights methods, um, except that we're going to do a multiplicative increase here. If the signs of the last two gradients disagree, we decrease the step size multiplicatively. And in this case, we'll make that more powerful than the increase, so that we can die down faster than we grow. We need to limit the step sizes. Mike Schuster's advice was to limit them between 50 and a millionth, um, I think it depends a lot on what problem you're dealing with. If, for example, you have a problem with some tiny inputs, you might need very big weights on those inputs for them to have an effect. I suspect that if you're not dealing with that kind of problem, having an upper limit on the weight changes that's much less than 50 would be a good idea. So one question is, why doesn't RProp work with mini-batches? People have tried it and found it hard to get it to work. You can get it to work with very big mini-batches, where you use much more conservative changes to the step sizes. But it's difficult. So the reason it doesn't work is it violates the central idea behind stochastic gradient descent, which is that when we have a small learning rate, the gradient gets effectively averaged over successive mini-batches. So consider a weight that gets a gradient of plus 0.1 on 9 mini-batches and then a gradient of minus 0.9 on the 10th mini-batch. What we'd like is those gradients will roughly average out so the weight will stay where it is. 
our prop won't give us that. Our prop would increment the weight nine times by whatever its current step size is and decrement it only once and that will make the weight get much bigger. We're assuming here that the step sizes adapt much slower than the time scale of these mini batches. So the question is can we combine the robustness that you get from our prop by just using the sign of the gradient, the efficiency that you get from mini batches, and this averaging of gradients over mini batches, which is what allows mini batches to combine gradients in the right way. That leads to a method which I'm calling RMS prop and you can consider it to be a mini batch version of R prop. R prop is equivalent to using the gradient but also dividing by the magnitude of the gradient. And the reason it has problems with mini batches is that we divide the gradient by a different magnitude for each mini batch. So the idea is that we're going to force the number we divide by to be pretty much the same for nearby mini batches. We do that by keeping a moving average of the squared gradient for each weight. So mean square WT means this moving average for weight W at time T, where time is an indicator of weight updates. Time increments by 1 each time we update the weights. The numbers I put in of 0.9 and 0.1 for computing the moving average are just examples, but they're reasonably sensible examples. So the mean square is the previous mean square times 0.9 plus the value of the squared gradient for that weight at time t um, times 0.1. We then take that mean square, we take its square root, which is why it has the name RMS, and then we divide the gradient by that RMS and make an update proportional to that. That makes the learning work much better. Notice that we're not adapting the learning rate separately for each connection here. This is a simpler method where we simply, for each connection, keep a running average of the root mean square gradient and divide by that. There's many further developments one could make for RMS prop. You could combine it with standard momentum. My experiment so far suggests that doesn't help as much as momentum normally does and that needs more investigation. You could combine RMS prop with Nesterov momentum where you first make the jump and then make a correction. And Ilya Satskiva has tried that recently and got good results. He's discovered that it works best if the RMS of the recent gradients is used to divide the correction term you make rather than the large jump you make in the direction of the accumulated corrections. Obviously, you could combine RMS prop with adaptive learning rates on each connection, which would make it much more like R prop. That just needs a lot more investigation. I just don't know at present how helpful that will be. And then there's a bunch of other methods related to RMS prop that have a lot in common with it. Jan Lacan's group has an interesting paper called No More Pesky Learning Rates that came out this year. And some of the terms in that look like RMS prop, but it has many other terms. I suspect at present that most of the advantage that comes from this complicated method recommended by Jan Lacan's group comes from the fact that it's similar to RMS prop, um, but I don't really know that. So a summary of the learning methods for neural networks um, goes like this. If you've got a small data set, say 10,000 cases or less, or a big data set without much redundancy, you should consider using a full batch method. There's full batch methods adapted from the optimization literature, like nonlinear conjugate gradient, or LBFGS, or Levenberg Markhart. And one advantage of using those methods is they typically come with a package. And when you report the results in your paper, you just have to say, I used this package and here's what it did. You don't have to justify all sorts of little decisions. Alternatively, you could use the adaptive learning rates I described in another video or RProp, which are both essentially full batch methods, but they're methods that were developed for neural networks. If you have a big redundant data set, it's essential to use mini batches. It's a huge waste not to do that. The first thing to try is just standard gradient descent with momentum. You're going to have to choose a global learning rate, and you might want to write a little loop to adapt that global learning rate based on whether the gradients change sign. 
but to begin with, don't go for anything as fancy as adapting individual learning rates for individual weights. The next thing to try is RMS prop. That's very simple to implement um, if you do it without momentum. And in my experiment so far, that seems to work as well as gradient descent with momentum, uh, probably better. You can also consider all sorts of ways of improving RMS prop by adding momentum or adaptive step sizes for each weight, but that's still basically uncharted territory. Finally, you could find out whatever Jan Lacan's latest recipe is and try that. He's probably the person who's tried most different ways of getting stochastic gradient descent to work well, and so it's worth keeping up with whatever he's doing. One question you might ask is, why is there no simple recipe? We've been messing around with neural nets, including deep neural nets, for more than 25 years now, and you'd have thought we'd have come up with an agreed way of doing the learning. There's really two reasons, I think, why there isn't a simple recipe. First, neural nets differ a lot. Very deep networks, especially ones that have narrow bottlenecks in them, which I'll come to in later lectures, are very hard things to optimize, and they need methods that can be very sensitive to very small gradients. Recurrent nets are another special case. They're typically very hard to optimize if you want them to notice things that happened a long time in the past and change the weights based on these things that happened a long time ago. Then there's wide shallow networks, which are quite different in flavor and are used a lot in practice. They often can be optimized with methods that are not very accurate because we stop the optimization early before it starts overfitting. So for these different kinds of networks, there's very different methods that are probably appropriate. The other consideration is that tasks differ a lot. Some tasks require very accurate weights. Some tasks don't require weights to be very accurate at all. Also, there's some tasks that have weird properties. Like if your inputs are words, rare words may only occur on one case in a hundred thousand. That's a very, very different flavor from what happens if your inputs are pixels. So to summarize, we really don't have nice clear-cut advice for how to train a neural net. We have a bunch of rules of thumb. It's not entirely satisfactory, but just think how much better neural nets will work once we've got this sorted out, and they already work pretty well.